Welcome to this video on how to fill out your Utah Financial Declaration Form in your divorce action. Now, financial declaration forms can be used in other domestic relations cases, but I'm a divorce lawyer. Let me introduce myself. I'm Eric Johnson, and I do mostly divorce work, and so this is for people that will be going through a divorce when they have to prepare the financial declaration. You can use this video in two different ways. You could watch or listen all the way through from start to finish before you work on your own financial declaration form. Or you could use this by pausing the video as you go, and then you can follow along with me as you prepare page by page, paragraph by paragraph. There's merits to both, uh, pr both processes, so whichever one works for you. If you're going to be working on this while you follow along with me, then you might want to have your financial declaration form open on a separate screen if you're using your computer or have a hard copy of the form in front of you so that as we go along you can write down on your hard copy and fill in make notes on it you may even want to just have a first draft that you're scribbling all over and then once you've got it all figured out transfer that to a final clean copy all right let's start with the first page you may have an attorney who will give you a form that's different from this one because it's been filled out already with your attorney's identifying information up here. But we're going to use, this is the official court's form off the Utah court's website because you can't get it wrong if you use this form. Some attorneys will alter this form and in some cases they will omit information that needs to be provided or they'll provide it in a way that's a little misleading or deceptive, and so I don't encourage you to use that sort of form if you have any question about that. But if your attorney is using this form and providing all the same information, there's no harm in doing that. If you are representing yourself, however, you would put your name, address, uh, and phone number and email here. Under the second part, you identify which party you are. If your attorney is going to be submitting this for you, then your attorney will identify himself or herself and by his or her bar number. And if you have a licensed paralegal practitioner representing you, then that person would also provide the bar number. You can get that from your attorney or licensed paralegal practitioner. You have to identify right here in this blank which number of the judicial district you're in. We have eight judicial districts, so you, depending upon what county you live in depends on what judicial district you're in. And then you have to provide the court address. You can get this information from the court by either calling the court clerk or going to the courthouse where your action was filed to get that information. Because we're talking about divorce actions, you'll be checking this box in this left uh, cell of the table here. This is known as the caption, by the way, and this will be in the marriage of. Okay, you, you check that box either by putting a check mark using your pen or your word processor or an X. The court will accept either one. You identify who the petitioner is on this line. You identify who the respondent is here. It, rarely, if ever, do you have other parties in the typical divorce case, so you'll usually leave that line blank. If the case has not been filed yet, then you won't have a case number. But if a case has been filed either by you or against you and you know your case number, this is where you write that on this line. You identify the judge. You can Id identify the judge simply by last name, but most people would uh, encourage you to identify the judge by the full name. Again, you can get that from the court, if you the courthouse, by calling the clerk or going there if you don't know, and identifying your domestic relations commissioner if you live in a judicial district where they have domestic relations commissioners. So if you find that there's only a judge that's been identified in your case and no commissioner, it could very well be that there is no commissioner assigned to your case. Again, you can get that information from the court clerk. Now, I'm not going to read every word here, so if you want to stop a moment and read what's on the, on the bottom of this page one, feel free to do that. It's useful information. I always encourage everyone to read forms like this, especially your financial declaration form, word for word, because these instructions are there for you to ensure that you know what's going on and how high the stakes are. Let's move to page 2 and paragraph 1. Most people will eventually, if they go to trial, have to submit their financial declaration to the court. They'll have to file the financial declaration with the court. You and your spouse will have to do that. But that's not always necessarily the case. You do not have to do this in every single case, every single time. So unless you know that there's an upcoming trial or a hearing 
where matters of financial support or division of property or things like that are going to occur, what you and your spouse will definitely do is exchange with each other a copy of your financial declaration. So you will check this first box. I'm not filing this with the court at this time because there's no hearing coming up. Or if there is a hearing, then you might end up sending a new copy to the court by filing it. Or you may update your financial declaration because several months have passed since you first prepared your financial declaration and your income or job may have changed, your expenses may have changed, other things may have happened that require you to provide fresh information and then you would check this second box. But if this is the first go around and all you're doing is exchanging your financial declaration with your spouse, you check the first box. Paragraph two is a list of documents that you have to compile and submit with your financial declaration, either to the court if called upon to do so, but definitely you have to give to your spouse, and your spouse has to give you the same documents as well. So as you can see, I'm not going to go into, into tremendous detail here, but you have to have tax returns for the two years filed prior to your filing for divorce. If you haven't filed tax returns, in the last two years before filing for divorce, then you have to provide the last two most recent tax returns that you have. You have to have pay stubs for the 12 months before the petition was filed, as you can see right here. And then you have to have loan applications. And these, now this is 12 months before the petition was filed for pay stubs, 12 months for any loan applications. Now, if you didn't file for or apply for any loans in the 12 months before the petition was filed, then you would come over here, and this is a good place to start, with what these boxes are for. You would say, does not apply because you didn't apply for any loans in the 12 months before the petition was filed. But tax returns, you would state attached. And if they're not attached, we'll talk about what you do on the next page or if they don't apply. Now, for most people, tax returns will always apply. But if you have no income and you're exempt from filing taxes, you could check that box. If you're self-employed and don't have pay stubs, then you can see that you have to you'll have to produce bank statements, and other business records that show what you're paid and how you're paid and how much you are paid. You have real estate documents. Even if you don't own property, but simply lease or rent property, you still have to provide a copy of your lease. But if you own property, you would have to provide a copy of your title, the mortgage papers, uh, tax documents showing what the assessed values are, and that sort of thing. And it'll tell you right there in the form, so you'll know what to do. And again, if you don't have this or some of these documents that are on this list because your spouse has them but won't give you a copy or won't give you access, you would say, well, they're not attached. And then on the next page, you'll explain why. So let's go to the next page after we get to financial statements. You'll notice there that's only for the three months before the divorce action was filed. And that's basically all of your financial institution information, your bank statements, your credit union statements, your credit cards, money market, your cash apps. That was, that's a recent change to this form. You know, there was a time I remember when there was no Zelle, there was no Venmo or PayPal, but now you have to provide records of those certificates of deposits, brokerage and retirement accounts. So let's go to page. Let's, let's scroll down now to the next page. You'll see right here in the middle of this page, uh, and then there'll, there'll be a checkbox. I marked some documents above as not attached. So if you don't have tax returns because your spouse won't let you uh, get to them or they were lost in a fire or you haven't filed taxes for a long time or something like that, this is where you would put uh, not attached my tax returns because reason my spouse won't let me have them or pay stubs. Uh, like I can't find those or I don't have those either. Or you would say uh, an explanation as to why you have not attached documents you are otherwise required to attach. Now, you might think, well, this will be great. I'll just claim that I don't have any pay stubs and then no one will know how much money I make. Your spouse could subpoena your employer for your pay stubs. So don't try to get coy and say that you don't have these documents because you'll be made to go get them if they're accessible to you or they're available to you, even if they may not be in your possession right now. But you'll also notice up here on page three, that you don't have to disclose all the information in this typical form, which, as you can see, is 14 pages long, in certain instances. Okay, so this, if your case does not involve dividing property or other 
valuables, another form of property, then you don't have to produce all the information in the standard court financial declaration form, and instead these bullet points show you what to do. But that's an exceptional situation, and we're not going to talk about that. We're going to treat this as though this is your typical situation, which most people will deal with when they're going through a divorce. Uh, in fact, everybody going through a divorce, unless there's no dispute over property or things like that, is going to use the court's regular form. The next paragraph is information about employment. So as you can see, you've got check boxes where you can show I'm employed. And if you're not, you'll see on this next page over here, I'm unemployed. But if you're employed, you check that box and then indicate whether you're an hourly employee, a salaried employee, whether you're self-employed, or there's some other employment arrangement that you have where you get this line to describe that. You'll also see that this form is telling you, well, if you're an hourly employee, give us your W-2 form. Make sure you include that with your financial declaration. Salaried, your W-2s. Self-employed, well, give us the 1099s, K-1, Schedule Cs, and things like that to show us what your self-employment income is. Then you have this box where you identify your employer's name. If it's you, you put self, but if it's somebody else, you would put Acme Corporation, the address and phone number of the employer, your job title, your hourly or rate, if you're paid by the hour, or your annual salary, and if you're paid by the hour. And even if you're not paid by the hour, I think it's important to point out that you work full-time or part-time or whatever that is. That's information that the court and your spouse or your spouse's attorney will probably want to know. So I would put that in there. There's no harm in mentioning that. Over on page four, if you're unemployed, you would check that box. And as you can see, there are lines to explain why you are unemployed. You may be unemployed because you recently lost your job. You may be unemployed because you're disabled. And that's where you would identify and explain that. Okay. If you have estimated some of the amounts in paragraph three, because you don't really know how much you get paid, and a lot of self-employed people don't do a lot of good bookkeeping, and they may that may be their excuse. It's like, oh, well, you know, I just kind of get by. It's an all-cash business. Uh, I, I live with my my family or my, my, my girlfriend or boyfriend or something like that, so I don't pay rent. I just kind of, we just kind of share expenses and we all get by. You would have to explain that, say, I can't tell you why I don't know how much income I make on a monthly or an average annualized monthly basis. Paragraph four is where you start to identify your in income. Most people, when they think of income, think about what I earned, my earned income, what my job pays me, whether I'm employed by someone else or self-employed. But income includes not only earned income, but unearned income. You may receive money from a trust or an annuity or a personal injury settlement. Uh, you may receive money as, as royalties for a book that you wrote or lottery winnings or anything like that. So you have to make sure that you don't just limit the identification of your income to your earned income. Make sure you identify both sources, earned and unearned, if you have any, if you're fortunate enough to have any unearned income. Now let's take a look at how this breaks it down. It, it categorizes the various kinds of income that most people have. It's pretty exhaustive, and you'll notice here, and I'll just, I won't keep you in suspense, down here at the bottom, if you have some other form of income that wasn't already on the list, then you've got this other call, or this other row right here where you can describe it. But let's go up here. So as you can see, you can identify your income by work, in other words, what you get through employment, rental income, business income, interest or dividends, retirement income, workers' compensation, disability insurance, social security disability or social security income, unemployment benefits, I'm just skipping now, veterans benefits, alimony from a previous relationship. In other words, if you've been divorced before and you are receiving alimony, that's what you would put here. If you're separated and your spouse is just giving you money, you would put that under other and then describe what that is. But alimony would be alimony from a previous divorce. Child support, same thing. If you're receiving money by way of child support from a previous divorce or other child custody dispute. All right. Payments from civil litigation, like I was talking about, a personal injury settlement is a good example, or victim restitution. That's actually where if you're a victim of the crime, of a crime, your state may be, give, may entitle you to receive victim restitution cash payments. 
So if somebody beat you up or something like that, there may be a fund that not only would the perpetrator might have to pay you, but you may be qualified to get victim restitution funds. But I've gone on for too long there. Public assistance like welfare benefits, support from other household members or non-household members, etc., etc. And then over in the right column, you would identify how much you receive each month. Now, if you don't receive a regular amount of money on a monthly basis, but get it every quarter, or you're not exactly sure how much it is until the end of the year, you would still need to take that, what you get each year, and divide that by 12 to come up with a monthly average. And if you only get paid quarterly, you would say, all right, well, I get paid quarterly, so I'll multiply that by, uh, I'll take that uh, amount that I get each quarter, multiply it by four, and then divide that by 12 to get my monthly average. Because as you can see, it's monthly amount you have to provide here. If you had to estimate some of your income because you don't have records to prove what that is, again, there's a box that you check, and then you have it here where you can identify what was estimated and the reason for that. If you have no income, you check this box and explain why. Paragraph 5 is where you show what your monthly tax deductions are. So anybody who is employed or people that have unearned income will pay taxes on that. And this is where you identify where the taxes come out. You can look at your pay stub, and uh, we'll make another video about how to read your the typical pay stub. But if you are someone who understands that, or you can go to your HR department and have it explained to you, then you'll know how much is taken out of your check, how much is withheld, each paycheck for federal income tax, state income tax, municipal income tax. There are actually some cities or towns that will uh, that will charge tax against your pay, so you may have to fill that out. Uh, I rarely, if, in fact, I can't remember the last time I ever saw that. And then FICA and Medicare, these are federal government programs that you have, that money is taken out of your check and withheld, and you have to identify that. And then you'll see over here on page six, you total up your total monthly tax deductions here. Again, because there's a lot of people that may not have very good records, or because they're self-employed, and or may not have good records, that if you don't know exactly what the tax withholdings are, you have to check this box saying, well, I estimate it, I can't tell you exactly what it is, either because I don't have a paycheck or because I don't understand how my paycheck lays these out, then you have to estimate and explain why. So then, once you've done that, you check this box for paragraph 6, explaining what your monthly after-tax income is. So here's my gross monthly income, everything that I earned, less my tax deductions, as you can see from section 5 or paragraph 5, and that gives you your after-tax net income that you put right here. If you have no income, you check that box right there. Now, it's interesting because it says right over here, I have no income on page 5, but for some reason, I don't know if they noticed this. It may just be an editorial error where they said, hey, we have this box here twice. I don't know. But you do have to check both boxes. If you're not employed, if you, I mean, if you have no income, rather, make sure you check both boxes, indicating that you've completed everything so nobody has any question as to whether you overlooked that. Paragraph 7 is monthly expenses. Okay? Now, if, once again, depending upon what's going on with your case, depends upon how you check these two boxes here. If nobody's requesting alimony, then you would simply put down what the current amounts are of your expenses, and so would your spouse. But if one or both of the parties is requesting alimony, you have to fill out your monthly expenses in two ways. Marital expenses, or what the monthly expenses are for the marriage or for the couple, and if you're separated, or somehow there's been a change from what it was as typical marital expenses, what your current amount of expenses are. Now you'll also notice this. You put down for your children or other dependents in your household, too. So what you do there is don't think it's just your expenses. If you have minor children or adult children or other members of the household who aren't even family members that you're paying expenses for, those are part of your monthly expenses. It's not just isolated to you individually. So once again, you can see that they give you a handy list of all these potential expenses that most people have. Most people do have a housing expense in the form of a rent uh, that they pay or mortgage. Real estate taxes, typically they pay that uh, if you have a house. 
uh, that you're more, that's mortgaged, your principal, interest, taxes, and insurance, PITI, are all covered by your mortgage payment. But sometimes that's not the case. So if you are paying a mortgage plus a separate tax payment, a separate insurance payment, then you put that there. Real estate maintenance, things like I pay the neighborhood kid to mow my lawn or shovel my walks or rake my leaves. Other things that you would say is, well, I live in a place where we have a lot of wind and so it's pretty typical that we find ourselves maintaining and repairing our roof on a regular basis annually. I may not do it every single month, but I have an expense that I may incur once or twice a year. I will break that down by 12 and put down what my average monthly expense is for my real estate maintenance and things like that. Food and household supplies. We all know what food is. Household supplies would be things like cleaning uh, products and other things like that that you use in your household that you may buy at the grocery store or department store that's other than food. Clothing, automobile payments if you have a, an automobile loan. And then let's scroll right down here. Insurance, fuel, maintenance. Again, very few people pay the same amount each month. So what you're doing is you're looking back over your receipts and expenses for the past year or years, if you're good at keeping those kinds of records, to find out what your average monthly expenses are in all of these categories. Some things are monthly, like utilities, telephone, and other things like that, but where they aren't, you have to average it out for the year. So you've got transportation costs if you ride the bus or take the train or you have a parking expense where you have a parking spot that you have to pay for, utilities for your home, telephone, paid television, cable, satellite. Uh, I'm sure at some point they're going to update this form again and they'll include streaming if you have ESPN streaming or Disney Plus or things like that. Your cost for internet if you have it, credit card, loans, alimony that you're paying. So we talked about earlier if you're receiving alimony from a previous divorce and now this may be an expense where you're the one paying alimony or child support or both from a previous divorce or from a previous relationship when it comes to child support. Child care, daycare, what you're paying on an average monthly basis, extracurricular activities for children. This is a good point to point out that you cannot put down what you wish you were spending on any of these things. It's what you are spending. And a lot of people try to get cute and say, well, I want my children to take equestrian lessons or horse riding lessons or ice skating, or I want them to take tennis lessons from a pro or something like that. You can't put down an expense that you're not actually incurring. So make sure that you do that. Now, sometimes you may want to note, hey, I'm going to need a new car. Uh, my car is 13 years old and on its last legs. But even then, if you don't have a car payment, but you know you'll have one soon, don't put down a phantom car payment that doesn't exist. Instead, what you may want to do is just indicate, I don't have this payment now, but I will be shortly, or I anticipate that I will. Just make sure that you're pointing out to your spouse and to the court, if that you file this with the court, so it doesn't look like you are lying or making up an expense you don't have. So you have extracurricular activities for children, education expenses for children, if there's a, a, a recurring, whether it's monthly or not, expense. Education for yourself, you may be someone that has to take a continuing education course uh, as a condition of keeping your license for your job renewed. That's where you would put this. Healthcare insurance for the whole family, if you're paying for that. Healthcare expenses that are not covered by insurance. Uh, other insurance, such as disability insurance or things like that, that you may pay. The costs that you have on average each month for entertainment, laundry and dry cleaning. So make sure that you separate that out from food and household supplies. I don't know why they broke out laundry and dry cleaning separately, except for there may be certain people that uh, wear a lot of fancy clothes, and so they have a regular recurring laundry or dry cleaning cost. Donations such as tithing or charitable donations that you make to your church or other organizations or foundations. Gifts. Now remember, that doesn't include just birthdays or just Christmas. That's all gifts. So think about all the reasons that you give gifts on a yearly basis. Anniversaries, weddings, birthdays, Christmas. Uh, you may have other reasons to give gifts at different times, Valentine's and other things like that. So make sure that you don't underestimate gifts because that can frequently happen. If you pay union or other dues, you put that here. If you have a garnishment that's being 
withheld from your check because you're in arrears in child support from a previous relationship or someone has a judgment against you that they're collecting. That's what garnishments are, where you're, it's being taken out of your pay or your paycheck. And then you have retirement deposits. You may be taking money out of the, your uh, sp spending money because you're saving money for the future, for retirement. So you would put that there. You may save money in a bank. And so since that's not listed already as one of your expenses, it's not technically an expense, but you may want to write down, well, I always put away $50 in my rainy day fund. And then you total that up. You would do so if marital expenses are one thing, current expenses if they are different. Again, as you can see, this is a recurring theme. If you estimated any of these expenses, you check this box, and then over here on this page, as you can see, you have to identify what items were estimated and provide an explanation as to why. Are you seeing a pattern emerge here? The more you can document your income, the more you can document the, the, your ownership or your lease of a building or something like that, the more you can document your expenses the better off you're going to be because you won't have to have the court decide whether to believe your claims because you can substantiate and establish by objective fact what your expenses are. I'm not asking you to believe me when I tell you how much I spend on automobile gasoline every month. I've got my Sinclair card or my Chevron card or my debit card right here, and I can show you every time I go to the gas station and what I'm buying on an average monthly basis. Have the documents. It's worth getting them so that you don't have your spouse or the court challenging you and saying, I just don't believe you. This doesn't seem right. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen people that have unusually high fuel expenses or automobile maintenance expenses or entertainment expenses or whatever it might be, and they're legit expenses. But they can't verify that. It's like, look, I really have. Strap me to a lie detector, which I would never advise you to do, by the way. But you get the idea. It's like, I'm really being honest. Well, if you can't prove it with independently verifiable evidence or documentation, the court may just say, yeah, I just think that's too high. I think you're lying. I think you're misrepresenting these expenses. And then you won't get credit for an expense that you actually incur. All right, let's move to paragraph eight. You have business interests. You may own a business and run your own business or may have an ownership share in a business, and that's where you identify that here. If you have no business interest, you identify that by checking this box. Otherwise, you check the I do have business interest and identify it by name, address, and phone, an identification of the business, the nature of what it does, the value of the business, if you, ha if you happen to know that. This is some place where a lot of people think, oh, I, I never keep track of what my business is worth. I mean, I am the business, or I just do it because I, I like being self-employed, or whatever it is. This is where you would come down. Again, you can see right here, I have to estimate that. But people aren't going to give you a hard time saying, look, I don't know what my the value of my business is, but if I had to guess, it would be this. And it's perfectly fine to say, I don't know what it's worth, or this is my estimate basis. I don't know. I guess if I were looking for a business like this, this is what I'd be willing to pay for my business, something like that. But you can see that some people may have more than one business, and so you've got at least two boxes. This is a good time to tell you that if for some reason you own multiple businesses, not just two, or have interest in multiple businesses, you can add another page. And you could say, uh, I've attached another page with some more additional business interest. I'm still identifying everything by name, address, phone, nature of the business, value, data formation, and the percentages I own. Uh, but you don't have to just be stuck saying, well, I have three businesses. I guess I'll just identify the two that I want everybody to know about. That's a big no-no. Don't do that. All right, let's go down to paragraph nine, where you have to identify your financial interests. If you have no financial assets, money in a bank, money in stocks or bonds or, or other kinds of accounts, if you don't have a retirement account, insurance or anything like that, then you would check this. Again, I've never encountered someone who has no financial assets whatsoever, so you'll probably find yourself checking this box, I have assets, and then you identify them. And as you can see, they've done a good job of categorizing it by almost every kind of conceivable asset. Bank and credit union, stocks and bonds, retirement, profit sharing, annuities, life insurance, whether it has cash value or is just term life, uh, whether someone owes you money, cash you have on hand. Again, you can see this is something relatively new at the time this video was made. It didn't used to exist, but now because of PayPal, Venmo and Zelle and other things like that, 
you now can identify documentation of the money you might have in a transfer app. Okay, so, uh, I'll just show you right here. You have to identify it by name and address of institution. The names on the account, so if it's just in your name, you want to identify that. But if it's you and your spouse, you identify them both. If it's you and your mother, you and your brother, you and a business partner, this is where you put this down by the names on the account, and then you identify the current balance as of the time you submit your financial declaration. Now, current balances can change wildly sometimes. That's not a problem. Don't worry about that. No one's going to say, oh, well, look, I, I, I saw what you wrote for the balance at the time you submitted your financial declaration to the court or exchanged it with me. But now look, it's two months later and that's changed. It's like, well, yeah, that, I, there's a lot of activity on certain accounts and some will stay static. Other accounts will grow, but that's no fault of yours. You can only identify what's happening and what the current balance is as of the time you prepare that. You are not required to keep updating your financial declaration all the time just because the balances may change due to no fault of your own. Once again, if you have, ident have estimated certain assets of your financial assets of yours, then you would check this box, identify what was estimated, and tell why. Paragraph 10 is real estate. If you don't own any, check this box. If you do, then you can identify most people, if they do own real estate, it's their home. So you can see that that's already provided there. Where you provide the asset, excuse me, the, the address for the asset, the date acquired, names on the title, original cost, current value. If you don't know that, you can estimate that and just put down estimate uh, right next to it. Uh, if there's a mortgage, you identify that. If there's a second mortgage or other lien holder, if you have a HELOC, a home equity, equity line of credit or something like that, you identify that, the amount owed, what your monthly payments are. Some people have a cabin, vacation property. Some people have bought a raw parcel of land they haven't done anything with or they own a meadow or ranch or something like that. You can identify that. If you own multiple parcels of land, again, just take that page and duplicate it and then identify all your real estate. You do not get to avoid or, or conceal that information just because there was only two places to identify real estate. If you have estimated the value or the purchase price or any of that sort of thing of the monthly payments, you would check here. I, again, say, this is what I estimated and here's why. Paragraph 11, personal property. This does not mean that you have to identify every knife, fork, and spoon or napkin that you own. But usually a good rule of thumb, even though there's no law that says this or court rule, is things about $500 in value or greater. Things under that, unless you have 10,000 items that are worth $350 a piece, you would not have to identify your clothing or your fishing pole or some just some of those sorts of things. Uh, uh, end table or something like that from Ikea. So things that are more than $500 would be, as you can imagine, vehicles. So they already tell you, hey, let's identify vehicles. You probably have at least one, maybe two, that you and your spouse drive respectively. So you identify that, the debt owed to anybody if it's encumbered by a loan, the names on the title, value, amount owed on the loan, and the monthly payments. If you have firearms, you did identify that here, art, furniture, it's of major value and things like that. Uh, you can also see there's only three lines there. I don't know why they did that, but just make sure you identify that personal property that is of some value, because if it's if it ends up that you, you and your spouse don't agree on how your personal property is to be divided, you may end up selling it. And so you need to put down things that may end up being sold. And again, if you need more space, go right ahead. If you do not know the values or the amounts owed or the minimum payments, Again, you have a place to identify that. Please try not to, uh, to estimate. Uh, try to do that as little as possible for the reasons I've given previously. Paragraph 12, we've already talked about what your assets are. Now we're talking about your debts and obligations. If you have no debts, lucky for you, you can indicate otherwise check I owe debts and then see here. You'll identify it by type of debt, to whom the debt is owed, who the creditor is, the names on the debt, so if it's just you on a credit card, or if it's you and your spouse, uh, if it's you and someone else that uh, owe medical debt or something like that, those are the names of the debtors, the amount owed, and the monthly minimum payments. Now, let's take a look at how that table looks on this next page. So, you have to identify the type of debt, an account number if there is one. Again, 
who the creditor is, who the debtors are, the amount that's owed, the balance owing, and monthly payments if that applies. If you had to estimate that, once again, do that here. And then there you go. You're at the end. You have to, you have to verify under penalty of perjury that what you did is, what you stated, what you disclosed is true and accurate. Okay. As you can see there. So if you're thinking, I'm going to misstate my income, I'm going to overstate my expenses or anything like that, you are, you are risking being penalized for perjury. I have to be honest, I've never seen that happen. Anybody held accountable or criminally prosecuted for perjury for misstatements on their financial declaration. But I have seen people frequently punished by courts for the, their dishonesty, saying, well, I'm going to penalize you here or there, or I'm going to award to the party, the innocent party, that asset that you did not disclose. That's one of the things the court can do. But more importantly, if you are dishonest on your financial declaration, the court can then say, because you were dishonest in this regard, I'm going to find that you're generally not a credible person. So if you talk about being a good parent when it comes to child custody and parent time matters, the court might say, well, you lied on your financial declaration. Why should I believe you're not lying now? Your credibility is very important, and one of the easiest ways to attack your credibility is for you either to intentionally leave something off of your financial declaration in an effort to hide or conceal it, or to just sloppily prepare your financial declaration and omit to include something in there. Most lawyers aren't going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Instead, they'll seize on the opportunity to say, you didn't, cons you didn't uh, identify or disclose. You were trying to hide. You were trying to lie. You were trying to deceive. So you want to be accurate as best you can, and you want to have estimates as few as possible. So we hope you found this this video useful to you. And if you have some questions that the form itself doesn't answer, or you have some questions about something unique to your case, we'd be happy to answer those questions for you, or at least address them with you if we don't know the answers. We'll try to track those down. You can give us a call at 801-466-9277, or you can contact me directly, eric at divorceutah.com. That's E-R-I-C at Divorce Utah, all one word, D-I-V-O-R-C-E-U-T-A-H dot com. We hope that you will review this video as many times as you need, and we hope this helps to demystify and take some of the anxiety out of this process. I'll end with this. It will probably take you, for the average person who has access to the documents needed to refer to in preparing your financial declaration, it will probably take you as far as just the work of filling out the form, two to three hours. The amount of time it will take to gather the documents could be a matter of days, but probably not a matter of more than a couple of weeks at best, unless you've got an uncooperative spouse or employer, or some of these documents are hard to obtain from financial institutions. But that's what you're looking at. You only have 14 days from the time that the clock starts to prepare and exchange your financial declaration. And if you try to put this off till the last minute, you will fail. So please, I hope this has given you the courage and the inspiration to start immediately. If you just eat this elephant one bite at a time over the course of 10 or 12 days, then when the deadline arrives, you've got it all done and you can breathe that much more easily. Thanks. Thanks.